I'm Kieran. I swallowed my first Lego brick at two years old, and I've been eating, breathing, and sleeping design ever since. I've been at ThoughtBot for about a year, and in that year, I've helped a variety of clients solve their product problems. Today, I want to talk to you about how we can do meaningful work in a culture that the number one priority is speed. Now, there are three steps that will help us in this effort. Being able to identify the real need that consumers have or the job to be done. How to iterate quickly to build a product that will satisfy that need or what's known as lean development. And how to do so most efficiently or learning to recognize work versus waste. But first, why do we need any of this in the first place? Isn't everything great? Well, maybe, but I would say that we all work in an environment defined by quotes like this one from Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO. He was asked in an interview 10 years ago what advice he had for young entrepreneurs, and this was his answer. He went on to say, we've optimized our culture so that people can come and build things quickly. We hire people who have a bias towards just pushing things very quickly. The whole culture is tuned around that. Now he meant the Facebook culture, but extrapolate as you will. I would argue that the tension between our individual desire for mastery and our collective desire for speed requires a more nuanced answer than this. It's hard to deny that there is enormous pressure to move fast. The business media can certainly command our attention by exploiting that pressure. And the market certainly rewards moving fast. If I throw a few Facebook friends up here, we see that prioritizing speed and the growth that comes with it works not just for Facebook, but for the industry in general. And it's not just tech. Clayton Christensen, in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, looked at hundreds of companies across diverse industries, including low-tech industries like steel and construction equipment, and showed that there are huge systemic rewards for moving fast. And when those huge rewards accrue at the scale of a company, you get Facebook, at the scale of an industry, you get tech, at the scale of a city, you get New York, a humming, thrumming monument to speed. New Yorkers move so fast, it befuddles the rest of the country. And at the scale of a country, you get, well, our national spirit. Yes, this is mostly driven by economic necessity, but on some level, we also choose this. We select for this. We like this. We like to be fast, to be first, to find the frontier, to be in front. The cost of moving fast, however, is that you often break <laughs> the thing you're trying to build in the first place. And the laundry list of problems Facebook has been confronting for the past two years, you could argue, represent this cost. The cost of broken things, of integrity compromised. So let's take a quick look at what those costs are. A company is really three things. The people who work there, the way that they work, and the things that they make. People, processes, products. When you move too fast, you can break any or all of the three. Breaking your people leaves them overworked, like these Apple employees, or in a toxic environment, like these Amazon employees, or ethically compromised, like these Uber employees, all driven by the need for speed. Breaking your processes, the way that your people work, can lead to waste, as happened in SNAP's product development process, or catastrophic neg negligence, as happened in Boeing's product development process. Again, decisions taken due to expediency. And when you rush to market, you can end up with a product that is fragile, like the now delayed Samsung Fold phone, or unpredictable, as with Apple's voice assistant Siri, or functionally inoperable, as when Tesla's autopilot fails. These products all overstate their abilities because they're trying to stay ahead of rivals or lock in first mover advantages. 
So those are the outcomes we want to avoid. What we would ideally want is to maintain momentum, but also maintain integrity. So let's try and do that. The first thing we need to do is identify a real need in the world or a job to be done. Job to be done just means a problem that real people are having. So for instance, you might want to remember the important parts of this talk. That's the problem you have or the job to be done to remember transient information. But there are many products you could hire to do that job. Some of you may use pencil and paper. Others of you, a notes app or a voice recording. Our challenge, if we want to build a product, is first to identify an outstanding job to be done and then to create something that people feel compelled to hire to do that job. So let's cement this with a bit of practice. I will throw up a job to be done and you tell me real products that we feel compelled to hire to do that job. Yes? What are some products that people feel compelled to hire to do this job? Google, Google yes. What else? Quora. Yes, Quora. What else? Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow. What else? Reddit. Reddit, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, Alexa, Siri, etc., etc. What about this one? Yes, what else? Say again? Yes, what else? Hotels.com. Hotels.com, yes. Yes. And your friends who live in other places. What about this one? Yes. What else? Craigslist. Yes, Craigslist. Yes, Amazon. Yes. What else? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wayfair, Salvation Army, etc. What about this one? Last one. Sorry. Netflix. Yes, Netflix. What else? Instagram. Yes, Instagram. It was HBO. <laughs> what else? YouTube. Yes, YouTube. Your dog, your, dog, your crossword, your family, etc. So there's a little formula you can use to help you define the job to be done. Situation, motivation, outcome. What uncomfortable situation have your have people found themselves in? What motivation does that situation create in those people? And what would a favorable outcome look like? Our product will be the bridge between the user's uncomfortable situation and a favorable outcome. So let's say that we wanted to disrupt the college cafeteria market, right? The situation that students might find themselves in is simple. They're at school and they haven't eaten in a while. Their motivation, naturally enough, would be to try and find nearby food that leaves them healthy and with enough time and money to do other things. Sandwiched in the middle is the job to be done. This is the problem that these consumers have. This is the job they currently hire the cafeteria to do. So now that we know how to define a job to be done, what is the best way to build a product around that job? How do we go from A to B? Well, if we are physically going somewhere, naturally we want the shortest travel time, and in an ideal world, we might decide to drive. Car takes us exactly where we want to go, we're always in control, and we can go as fast as we want. And that's true in an ideal world, but we are never in an ideal world, we are only ever, unfortunately, in this one. And this is actually Midtown Manhattan, this is actually our office. There are traffic lights and road restrictions and construction and all kinds of idiosyncratic obstacles that make what look like a simple journey take two to three times longer than it otherwise would in ways that are very hard to predict. Plus, to drive a car, you have to have a car. In the real world, it turns out, the fastest way to get to our office 
is to walk there. Unlike a car, it takes almost no effort to get going. Most people can do it, and it's easy to adjust your route along the way. Now, this is also true when bringing a product to market. Instead of gathering a big brain trust and the best equipment, start with the smallest team possible and nothing except the problem. Create the quickest, cheapest solution you can and then work your way to better and better solutions in small steps, adapting to the obstacles that you encounter along the way. And this way of working, of starting with little to no overhead, of breaking the work into small achievable pieces to ensure progress, of structuring those pieces so the goals are clear, and of being able to create, discard, and change plans all the time, or what's known as lean development, is a way of ensuring timely results in an unpredictable environment. Now, we'll translate this from a transit roadmap into a product roadmap in a minute, but first, let's review what traditional product development looks like. Here's how most products get made. Someone has a product idea. That idea gets projected numbers and a business model attached to it, and then it gets schematics and mockups, and then it gets built and tested and pushed out the door. Now, this whole sequence, where each stage once visited cascades into the next, is called waterfall development. Water only flows downstream, and here the product flows downstream from concept to reality. This is an old and well-established paradigm, many decades old even in software. Here is a Department of Defense spec from 35 years ago for creating government software that lays out the very same sequence. Inspire, specify, design, build, test, and release. Now this is not an inherently bad process. In fact, it's great for products that are only superficially new, like a new cushion at Pottery Barn, or a new Call of Duty video game. If I'm, if I'm inventing a new Doritos flavor, there is a lot of good, reliable information about the other flavors of Doritos that might make waterfall development the best choice. But for truly new products, this is a bankruptcy just waiting to happen. And I want to quickly highlight just a few problems. First, most ideas are bad. <laughs> By which I mean that most ideas have no more chance of turning into a profitable product than I have of making a half-court shot at Madison Square Garden. In fact, I'm actually more likely to make that shot. Only one in 3,000 pitches to VC firms becomes a commercially successful product. Those are not great odds. And for a new product, by definition, you are largely in a position of ignorance. Any numbers you generate now are so provisional as to be largely useless as a basis for decision making. And as for design, you cannot evaluate a design in isolation from users. Design is the art of making human-friendly choices. If you don't know which humans you're designing for, you cannot have confidence that your choices are friendly for them. You can design a sneaker, and it may function fantastically well as a sneaker, but if your users need heels or rollerblades or snowshoes, that's bad design. And again, in the absence of consumers, teams will tend to measure success by how much they have done. How many gigawatts, how many features, how many lines of code, instead of how useful those efforts actually are. And since testing is near the end of the waterfall, it tends to focus on making sure the product does what the creators think it should do, rather than what consumers think it should do. In other words, what gets tested is how the product works, not why it exists. And finally, having a capital R release at the end creates an arbitrary finish line to cross, which further divorces the product from the people it is ostensibly supposed to help by making the deadline the objective in and of itself. All of this goes some way to explain why of the one million new small businesses created each year, 60% of them fail to become profitable. And why the most common reasons given by those failed entrepreneurs are that no one wanted what they were selling, and that they ran out of money, which is essentially the same thing, a failure to find product market fit. 
So if this is the road to ruin, then what is the street to success? Well, think about when you've created something useful for yourself, like say, a dress. What do you do? You make a quick rough cut of the fabric, and then you pin it and you try it on. And you look in the mirror, and you adjust, and you look, and you stretch, and you say, can I raise my arms? Can I bend over? And you keep going until you have something that really fits you. And only then, at that point, do you make sure, do you invest time in making sure that hems are hemmed, trim is trimmed, sequins are sequined, and so forth. And if we port that same try-as-you-go approach to building products, we get something like this, helpfully formalized by Eric Ries in his book, um, <clears throat> The Lean Startup, as a build, measure, learn loop. Build, measure, learn. This is essentially just the scientific method applied to product development. Hypothesis, experiment, observation. So let's say that the initial product idea that we had was not about the college cafeteria and disrupting that market. Let's say the initial idea we had was just to help college students manage their time. So we went to Columbia and we talked to some students and they told us that there were lots of events, lectures, lunches, banquets, that they would like to attend if only they knew about them. So we said, okay, we'll build an event calendar. Now, we could spend a lot of time and money building an amazing web app with Google Calendar integration and reminders and lots of bells and whistles, but how would we know at this point which bells to ring, which whistles to blow? Instead, let's just fire up a simple blog in one day and start posting events on or around the Columbia campus. So there we go, we launched, we did it. Now, the perfectionist in us hates this, right? It's ugly, it doesn't do much, it's barely even a product. But it's out there, in the real world, where real users, in this case actual Columbia students, can start to teach us how to improve it. And lo and behold, after a few weeks, we noticed that the only posts with any real traffic all have something in common. They were all for free events. So we say, okay, we'll make it easier to find free events. So we start to tag them, and we put a link on the homepage. And then we notice that our traffic starts to spike around mealtimes. And so we, we say, okay, well, maybe what students are trying to do is actually to find free food. So we filter the homepage to only show events with free food. And then restaurants start to email us because they notice students are mobbing their competitors. And now at this point, armed with real users, a validated job to be done, and an emerging business model, we can decide to invest in building our own custom web app and to continue iterating from there. Now working in this way, forces us to expose our assumptions early and often. It gets a real product out into the world where we can meet and understand actual customers, and it forces us to adjust direction based on evidence rather than faith or a promised future. It doesn't mean that there isn't a role for intuition, but instead of the whole enterprise depending on it, we can harness intuition every time we need to jump from observation to inspiration. Instead of saying, I know what people want, we can say, I know how to fix the problem that we found. So now that we know how to learn quickly, let's try to respond efficiently to what we learn. Taiichi Ono was an industrial engineer in the 50s and 60s who faced what seemed, at least to me, to be an impossible problem. Toyota at the time was a fledgling car maker in Japan's tiny and volatile post-World War II economy. How could they possibly compete with the quality and cost of imported American vehicles that were spit out in huge numbers at low cost thanks to our economies of scale? And what Ono realized after a time was that those same economies of scale forced US automakers to incur some other costs the costs of having a lot of inventory, excess parts that had to be stored, 
and kept track of and transported, excess cars that had to be parked and protected. If there was a way to eliminate all of those costs, then there was a chance of being competitive. So I'll give you an example. Here are all the steps if I wanted to make a cup of tea in the kitchen behind you. Now, I have made a lot of cups of tea in the past year, so I've tried to make this process as efficient as possible. But if we just focus on the first half here, and if I throw up Ono's classification of wastes, we see that there is quite a bit of waste in my cup of tea product development cycle. Here is some transportation waste. Here is some open production. Here's a bunch of inventory. And here's some waiting. And if we were to go through the whole list like this, we would be left quite magically with just the truly transformative parts of the process. Even though realistically I have to include some other steps right now, knowing the transformative steps will guide any improvements that I want to make. And this is exactly how Ono defines work, as changing the nature of the product. Toyota is now one of the largest car makers in the world, in no small part because of the productivity gains that Ono was able to achieve. So now that we know what waste is, let's minimize it both in our process as well as the product itself. First, let's look at our process. As we iterate and improve our college food web app, Every time we come to the build stage of our build, measure, learn loop, we're going to have some set of tasks to do, right? And if we can identify tasks that will reduce waste, as well as tasks that might introduce waste, then we can reprioritize accordingly. Now, we could take each task and go through the list of owner's wastes, and it would, it would take a lot of time. There is a shortcut. For each task, all we have to do is write a smaller job to be done. If we can easily find a customer pain point, a logical motivation, and a favorable expected outcome, then this task represents value-added work. If we can't, however, then the task is probably wasteful. In this case, the waste of overprocessing. Second, we want to minimize waste in our product. That means making efficient use not just of our resources, but the customer's resources. So let's establish some metrics for ease of use, for how efficiently we are using the customer's resources. First, time. How much time does it take to get the job done? Apple Pay is faster than a credit card. Flying is faster than taking a train to San Francisco, but slower to Boston. How much does it cost? $15 a month for Netflix is less than $100 a month for cable. Can we reduce the physical labor necessary to get the job done? Instacart saves your trip to the supermarket. Sewing machine makes life easier on your fingers. How much brain power does it take? Turn by turn directions allow us to think about other things while we're driving. And how socially acceptable is it to hire our product? How alien or out of place will it make you seem to others? Does anybody remember the nickname for people who wore Google Glass? Glass holes. Glass holes, <laughs> right. And vaping products currently give people a more socially acceptable alternative to cigarettes. Hence, they're growing adoption. And finally, what's the learning curve? How much do people need to know or learn to hire us? Google Sheets uses the same spreadsheet formulas as Microsoft Excel to try and lower how much you have to learn to switch. You can think of these elements of simplicity as a series of sliders. The higher the knob on the slider, the harder it is for people to adopt the product. The lower the slider, the easier. These are relative measurements, not absolute measurements a way of comparing one product to another for a given job to be done. For example, let's take the job that you've hired me to do right now, which is to learn how to solve problems, how to build successful products. You've hired this talk, but you didn't have to. You could have watched a bunch of YouTube videos instead. So if we take YouTube as our baseline, if this represents the YouTube experience, right? 
then this top cost you a little more and required a lot more legwork to get here. So why are you here? Because it's actually faster and less taxing to listen to me. Well, my wife would disagree, but it, it is usually faster and less taxing to listen to a talk than to master these ideas on your own. For this job, your time and concentration are worth a little more to you than the money and the legwork. That's critical for me to know, because this is usually a zero-sum exercise. The opportunity to lower the customer's cost in one area raises the cost in others. So let's do this again, this time for our college food web app. The job to be done, remember, is to find cheap food nearby. Our users are college students, and our baseline comparison product is going to be the college cafeteria. Okay? So compared to the cafeteria, what do we think is the shape of our product? Let's, let's, let's talk it through. What do we think is going to go down? What, is, what do you think is going to go up? Time will go down. Time will go down? Let's, let, let's see why. Why, why, why do you think um, it will go down? Uh, less time to acquire food for the app than campus. Okay, and, and who thought it might go up? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Uh, when we were looking at the build, measure, learn loops, did our users teach us what their most valuable resource was? Money. Say again? Money. The money. So I, I think it's a good bet that, that you know, we're going to save them some money compared to, you know, we have, we have businesses competing with each other. We can probably save them some money. We're probably going to save them a little time. So if we, if we assume for the purposes of this exercise that the money is going to go down, the time is going to go down by a little bit, but since we know this is zero sum, what's going to go up? Thought. You have to decide. What else? Labor. So you have to look. Yes. Yeah. All right. It's, and again, it's not like this is some perfect answer. This is an exercise, right? Uh, but uh, yes, students will have to do a little bit more walking, maybe a little bit more deciding, and they will have to learn how to use the app, right? So essentially what we're saying is that because college students are broke and relatively busy, but young, bright, and willing to learn things, then this shape conserves what is important to them at the expense of things that are less so. Right? And now you know how to build a compelling product. All you have to do is identify a need by defining the job to be done, Use lean development to learn and iterate quickly to serve that need and identify and minimize waste by focusing on efforts that are transformative and important to your users. Thank you very much. I will now take questions if there are, is such a thing. Under what circumstances are waterfall acceptable? If you're a Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I can improve on that answer. <laughs> um, so, so, again, it's not that either process is inherently good or bad, but it really depends uh, how much do you know before you begin. If I'm, in, if I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I have a lot of good, reliable knowledge, because the thing that I'm making is very, very similar to things that are already out in the world and have been validated, then waterfall development might be a great choice. Uh, if, however, I'm not in that position, if I'm in a position where I am venturing into truly new territory and trying to disrupt some market, then then the idea that I'm going to choose a path 
where I, I cannot learn rapidly is not the best idea. Other questions? How important is it to know, I mean, in the iterative process, you get information about what people value and what they don't value. How important is it to know why they do? Um, is that something that's um, relevant in the iterative process, or do you not really care so long as the outcomes are the outcomes you're looking for? Right. Uh, I suppose it is possible to to respond somewhat blindly to to you know seeing some measurement, uh, but I, I think in in any actual product development cycle, knowing why your users are making the choices that they're making would give you more reliable information to act on. So I would say it is it is very important to know why your users are making the choices that they're making, and so. There are a variety of tools that you can use when you come to the measure portion of your loop. Uh, you, if it's, say, a website, then you have, you have say, all kinds of, of digital metrics that you can use, how many hits you've gotten, what pages people are going to. But there are also more quality, qualitative methods like user interviews, in which you can dig deeper and try and get to the motivations behind users' behaviors. Other questions? Yes? Do you abstract from the fact that someone else might be developing the same thing at the same time, which is what leads to like making it pizza colored and all this kind of thing? So you just sort of <laughs> say, you know, we're going we're gonna to make our product and we're not going to worry about competition and just until we get, until we get there. So, so is, is the question, is competition a form of validation, or is it something that you that is um, included in this process? You know, like people, you know, monitor the market to see if somebody else is developing something similar in ways, you know, above board and below board. But um, <laughs> in this case, it abstracts from from that. Yes, I, I mean, I would say that. In general, we try and get our clients to not get too obsessed with what competitors are doing because the objective of the build, measure, learn cycle, the objective of lean development and all of this is to better serve your customers. And it's really, it's really whoever is doing the best job of that is going to win in the long run. Um, it is possible that you can learn something from what your competitors are doing. If, if your three competitors are all doing something, then it's worth a look to see if the, if the reason they're doing that is because it better serves your, your customers. But I would say that the end remains to serve your customers and not to pay attention to your competitors. Would you say, um, so I'm in org that it's, they have a year-long roadmap. They know what they're building way in advance. Um, and we're a blend of agile and waterfall. Is it more difficult to be agile when you have that year long roadmap already set? I feel like with, with bigger companies, like waterfall is almost the default when you have, you know, you know what you're going to be building like six to 12 months from now. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh... One of the questions I would ask is, how did we get that roadmap? Uh, who decided that that was the roadmap and on what information? If, if it is the case that we are coming out with the newest version of Microsoft Word, we basically already know who the users are, we're trying to increase market share by 2%, etc., etc., et cetera, then then maybe maybe that that's okay to have that that roadmap, you know. Uh, even in a large organization, I think I, so. So I don't think the size of the organization is really what should determine whether you use a more agile or lean approach versus waterfall. I think it's more about what what knowledge position are you in? How much do we know? How much are we unsure about? And so even if 
even if I'm in a large organization and I feel that we are really in a position of ignorance, I would advocate more to use a lean process. Even if that means like creating a little rogue team that, is, that, it, that, it, that has a responsibility for learning initially where the market and the product should go. So does this mean that the lean process don't have the roadmap at all, or you will have different set of roadmap? Well, for the lean process, the roadmap is going through that cycle. It, instead of it being a line, it's a circle, right? So, so in, instead of deciding at, at sort of at the beginning where you're going to end. But, but you kind of need to plan a next circle based on the, your previous learning. Yes. So how, like how the scope of the roadmap, how, can, can it be like one year or two years? What, what kind of scope will be make sense in this situation? Well, the scope is really up to the, the team, right? You, you, you know what resources you have available. You know how many people are on the team and how deep your, your pockets are. So based on that, you can decide Essentially, the faster you go through the loop, the, the cheaper your product development becomes. So if you, can, if you can figure out, based on the resources that you have, how fast you need to go through those loops, then, you, then you're somewhat determining what the scope is. So do you think that the faster is better or the slower is better? Which one is better? <laughs> well, I think that it's, it's hard for me to think of a situation in which learning slower would be okay. better. Always faster. So I, I'm heavily incentivized towards shortening those loops. Yes? Is that lean methodology supposed to be used in conjunction with the agile process? Um, so you're working on one feature, one function, and throughout you're going through these loops of that lean process? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a the distinction, in my mind at least, between lean and agile is that lean is really about not doing anything that doesn't contribute to the learning that we need to, that we, that we want. And agile is more about maintaining maximum flexibility to change direction if we need to change direction. So, so really, to, in, in my mind, there is no conflict between these, these two approaches. They are to be used in conjunction so that we can learn quickly and adjust quickly. Yes. The stage, the long, how would you uh, describe the describe sorry the design thinking and the user centric approach, the benefits of the tool, the process of long fast. Let me just make sure I understand. The question is, how would I describe the benefits of learning fast? Yes, of the benefits of the user-centric approach and design thinking to the process of learning fast. In other words, let's say I had to make this case to somebody higher than me in the organization and I was advocating for, for this approach. Uh, I, would, I would say to, to, to that person that this is much cheaper in the long run, even if it means that we have to push our initial deadline back by two or three weeks, that, I mean, it, it, go, it goes back to, to that example of, of the dress. If, if we were to make dresses for ourselves by making the finished dress every single time and only then trying them on, we would go through a lot more fabric than if we used safety pins and tried it on ourselves first. So, so even though there is always some immediate deadline milestone to hit, which is incentivizing just pushing something out the door, I would always push for, for anything that increases our learning because that is going to save us time and money, if not this week, next week. Yes? When you're going through these cycles, um, are the customers at the beginning um, a different group that are early adopters or just odd um, beta users than the people that um, come later on and how do you adjust for that? 
It's a great question. Um, so, so there is this idea that that um, for any job to be done, people sort of segment themselves into four groups: early adopters, early majority, late majority, and and the stragglers. Um, and each of the idea is that each of these customer segments may respond to different incentives. I think I think there is some some truth to this and and so when you're developing a new product what you are in is in essence doing is attracting your early adopters and it may turn out to be the case that as you scale what appealed to your early adopters is not what appeals to the early majority i don't think that changes the objective that you need to have because it's a bit putting the cart before the horse I cannot worry about the late majority until I have some early adopters. And I think that the build, measure, learn cycle inherently takes into account this kind of change. Because as you keep measuring, you'll start to get different results and you'll, you'll change direction according to whatever stage you're at. But it's a good question. Yes. It's interesting that this process um, would seem to require um, some healthy humility, which is the opposite of Mr. Zuckerberg that started. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't know Mr. Zuckerberg personally, so I, I cannot speak <laughs> for his humility. <laughs> but, but yes, this this is a very humbling process, and it, that's it's one of the reasons that it's it's nice to work with this process is because uh, no matter how smart we think we are, um, you know, less than 50% of what we think is going to happen happens. And, and we, have to, we have to sort of sit ourselves at the foot of the consumer and, and learn from, from what their needs and priorities actually are. It's a great point, yes. Um, what do you make of um, the approach of the customer doesn't know what they want? There's two job things at some point. Yes. And you have to basically tell them what they want. Yes, that, yes, that's, a, that's great. That's great that you brought that up. Um, I don't think that this lean development cycle is the same thing as blindly following the consumer. I think every time you have to go from measuring to learning, every time you have to go from observation to inspiration, there is the opportunity for creativity, for something unexpected. I, I think if, if, if the process was, was different and it was just like programmatically tied so that whatever was whatever happened in measure automatically resulted in something predetermined happening in the learn part of the cycle then it would be the same as just following your users blindly down a path so so i think that i think that there is room for creativity and inspiration in this cycle and i and i i think that the best products from apple and otherwise use this kind of methodology Uh, can you give an example of a time or a product or like a, a product or idea that you were working on that was invalidated? That you went through this and then you and then you realized that it wasn't gonna work and you needed to pivot. Yep, sure. Um, there was a client that uh, uh, I'll just obscure some details to protect the innocent, but um, they were building a, a social network for a particular vertical, a particular industry. And they were doing that because they wanted to increase the, the amount of communication that was happening in this industry. But uh, when they built this social network, uh, nobody used it. And nobody used it because they hadn't bothered to ask the users if they wanted this. They assumed that they did. Um, and when we, when we went and asked the users what they wanted. They wanted an entirely different set of things. So we started to build those things instead, and they started to get users. 
I know that's very vague, but... <laughs> so vague as to be useless. That was not a great answer. Have you run into a lot of those moments where you've had to convince the client that they have to first understand if there is a user for their product? And how do you handle that situation when it comes? Yes, so... so you need somebody in every company who has a blazing vision, you know, and because you need to galvanize people and resources around a particular goal. And so often that person who has that vision uh, pushes back against this kind of approach because it seems like what you're saying is uh, we don't really care about your vision. What we care about is these people over here. Um, but I see, I see that vision as happening at a higher a higher level of, of abstraction than than our tiny moves with the customer uh, what 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 this does is really just give you a way to implement that person's vision as opposed to invalidating it it's really saying okay what you want to do is imp is improve discourse within this industry we're going to use this methodology to do that you know, so that, that's how I would square that circle. It, it's not easy, but... <laughs> I think there's like a fine line between innovation and marketing and learning what people want versus what you're trying to innovate and now you're like, well, this is what you really need. And as a consumer, can you start believing, oh yeah, this is what I really need. And, but then is it really something that I need? Do you know, like... And I think there's that there's that line where ethically or you know humanly whatever it is you're thinking constantly about what you're suggesting um, and also suggesting something different sometimes. But I don't know how much of that is really what a consumer wants or needs um, or later decides oh this is really cool I'd like to adapt. It right. wasn't necessary. Like sometimes we are like for example developing apps which is solving personal problems. Uh, for instance, um, but then you get you use you get used to it. And you're like, yeah, I like this. This is a great change, great innovation. But then, do you really need it? I guess. Yes, I I don't think that this methodology or any methodology should be a substitute for your own moral compass. <laughs> and if if in going through this cycle, I were to learn that my users would respond very favorably to opioids. I am not going to go in that direction because my own moral compass would prevent it. So this to me exists, exists in conjunction with our own, our own ethics. And and the mistake would be to substitute one for the other and say, well, because the users want it, then I must give it to them. So. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>